Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College, and I'm very pleased to welcome everyone who's here today, uh, namely all the members of my class, um, people who are enrolled in, the, uh, in the, the Spring Honors Lecture Series on Social Justice, and uh, welcome to our visitors who are with us today, as well as anyone uh, who may be watching us on YouTube. So our series proper has concluded and we are now um, meeting for the final time this semester. Um, it has been our practice for as long as we've had the Honors Lecture Series to devote time at the end of the series to different things like uh, applying for scholarships and fellowships on one day, more recently learning about reflective thinking and the e-portfolio. Uh, but one thing that has been a mainstay in the series has been a session devoted to student uh, presentations. And so Dean Vile and I, uh, who, who both of us chair the majority of the honors thesis defenses, uh, we have the hard task at the end of the semester to select a couple of, of students uh, who have successfully defended their theses and uh, ask them if they would be willing to give a presentation. And so I'm, I'm very pleased that we have two students uh, with us today. We have Miranda Renzi and Hanan Bayen. And so I think we will uh, start with, uh, with Miranda. Uh, what we ask is that our speakers spend some time talking about their project, their research or creative project, and then offer us some thoughts on the process and pass along any words of wisdom that they would like to pass along. We have enough time in the class so that after each one has presented, um, has given her, her presentation, then we'll have time at the end for people to ask questions. And so things that you might, uh, things that you might not want to ask uh, Dean Vial or, or me, uh, you might be more apt to ask uh, one of your peers and and both both of these people have done an outstanding job with with their projects and they're very approachable they're very nice and i'm sure they'll be glad to answer any questions that you have so our first speaker today is miranda renzi uh, who is a music business major with a minor in business admin administration the title of her thesis is hear her voice an analysis of selected songs by American female songwriters of the 1960s and 70s, written under the direction of Dr. John Dugan, who teaches in the Recording Industry Department at MTSU's College of Media and Entertainment. And we have Dr. Dugan with us today. Miranda will be graduating in August of 2021 and plans to work in the music industry either in Nashville or LA. She's a singer, songwriter, and multi-instrumentalist who's passionate about inclusion, representation, and equity in music. Miranda is also passionate about music therapy and enjoys performing for patients in healthcare facilities. So join me in welcoming Miranda. Thank you for that warm welcome. All right, so, um, okay, I'm spotlighted now, great. All right, so in my thesis, I discussed prominent female songwriters from the 1960s and 1970s and the impact that they've had on American culture and popular music. And uh, since it was a creative project, I re-recorded four songs by different female songwriters, including Dolly Parton, Aretha Franklin, Anne and Nancy Wilson, and Carole King. I wanted the project to feature a variety of genres. So all four songs are different in terms of their musical style and their subject matter. Um, in addition to recording the songs, I provided background information about um, all of the songwriters and the circumstances under which the songs were recorded. And I also did an extensive musical and lyrical analysis for each song. Um, in terms of the process of doing all my research, what I did was um, in narrowing down a topic, I love all kinds of music, but I really wanted to focus in, I like to look at history and understand, you know, how have we, why are we where we are now? And thinking about lots of different musical artists who are women, Taylor Swift, Casey Musgraves, 
Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, et cetera, you know, they have a lot of feminist messages and women didn't used to be so political in music. They didn't get to speak their mind. And I wanted to take a look back and ask the question, when did the tide start to change? When did women start becoming more political? When did women speak up in their music? When did they really, you know, start using their voices um, in American popular music? And I really zoned in around the 1960s and 1970s because there was the civil rights movement, there was second wave feminism, there was more of an LGBTQ rights movement, there was so much going on, uh, the anti-war movement as well. And um, all of that kind of culminated in a songwriting renaissance in the United States where there were lots of female songwriters. And um, I selected these four because they are both artistically excellent and have a lot of commercial success. And um, as a result, you know, we still talk about Dolly Parton, for example, so much today, especially here in Tennessee. Um, she's done so much using her voice and, um, you know, making waves for women and people who are less fortunate and marginalized in the music industry and around the country in various places. So um, just discussing the significance of all of them and the artistic work that they've done. And, um, you know, the research was mainly done through reading articles and books, watching documentaries, just vacuuming up a lot of information to give me context about who I specifically wanted to discuss and why. And that was what narrowed me down to these four artists in addition to selecting them by genre. So I selected soul and R&B as one genre. I selected country. I selected singer songwriter and I selected rock. Now that by no means encapsules all of the you know, many, many genres of music in America, but I thought that it was a good sample platter of what was going on at the time and what kind of messages they were sending. Um, about just the, the process in general, it was a lot of reading. It was a lot of reading, a lot of researching, um, a lot of um, studying things both musically and academically, because again, it was the balance of the creative and the academic, getting both in, getting both solid. Um, I worked with a producer here in Nashville who helped me record the songs and arrange them. And um, I, I really enjoyed doing a creative project. I initially was leaning more in a research project direction, but I ended up doing creative because I myself am a musician and that's where my strengths lie. And I think that, you know, doing something creative, doing something outside of the box, it really allowed my project to be a lot stronger as a result. So if you're on the fence about creative versus, you know, just a research thesis, I, I, I am partial to creative, um, especially if you, you know, you consider yourself to have a creative side. It's a great outlet for that because it ended up being very fun <laughs> recording all of the music. Um, but I, I started about a year in advance with just pulling all of the information together, narrowing down a topic. Um, it, I initially was talking about female songwriters of the 20th century and then narrowed it down to the two decades specifically in America to discuss their music in the context of all of the social and cultural things that were happening at the time. Um, so, and that is, that is one thing. And Dean Vile, when I had my uh, thesis um, proposal meeting, he recommended don't bite off more than you can chew, narrow it down and do a really great job of discussing something specific. So that's what I ended up doing and it also greatly strengthened my project. Um, but I don't wanna keep talking in circles. If anyone has any specific questions or anything specific, uh, you Dean Vile or Dean Phillips that you would like me to touch on. Why don't you tell them the four songs specifically that you picked out? Sure. So uh, the four songs I selected, um, Respect by the immortal Aretha Franklin, uh, Nine to Five by Dolly Parton, You've Got a Friend by Carol King, and Barracuda by Heart. And Heart is a female fronted rock band, uh, the leaders of which are Anne and Nancy Wilson, who are sisters. And uh, the four songs were, again, completely different in terms of style because rock, soul, country, <laughs> singer songwriter, there's all of these different styles. And it was a wonderful challenge and wonderful growth experience to have to sing in all of those different styles. And if any of you are lis interested in listening, or um, reading what I have, I'd be happy to paste the Google Drive link so you can understand more about how my project worked all together. Cause I know it sounds like there's, there's recordings over here and there's writing over here, but it all did come together really well. Um, 
but each song had a distinct message and a, you know, a unique perspective because they were written by women for, you know, a, an audience of, you know, people of many genders. It wasn't just women writing for women. Um, it was women writing for everyone and sending their message and their perspective out into the world. And um, Respect, for example, it was actually originally written by an incredible soul artist, Otis Redding, from a man's perspective. And what happened was Aretha Franklin and her sisters took the song, rewrote some of the lyrics and turned it basically into not only a you know, girl power anthem, but of women commanding respect, but about, you know, it became an anthem of the civil rights movement as well. You know, respect, it, it is so important. And it was so just powerful in her version, Otis Redding's version, you know, it wasn't as popular. So when Aretha did her version, it took it to the next level. Um, and another, um, you know, important anth anthemic song, this one came much later than Respect, Nine to Five, Dolly Parton. Women, you know, ever since, you know, the 1960s on, there have been fluctuations, but more and more women have been entering the workforce. And, you know, it hasn't always been a smooth experience for us, um, whether it's sexism or having to balance a lot of the other duties that women are, you know, expected you know, to deal with, with motherhood and taking care of a home, you know, it can be a very complicated and difficult endeavor. And so that song touched on that aspect of women's lives. Um, with You've Got a Friend, this song is interesting because the most popular version of it was recorded by James Taylor, who is a male artist. But the beautiful thing about the song is there aren't that many popular songs that are solely about friendship um, in a very platonic way. And um, I thought that it was really unique that, you know, there's always so much emphasis on romance and intimacy and other things in music. So to have a song that was just about a pure friendship that was completely gender neutral, which is why James Taylor was able to re-record it without changing a single word. I thought it was really powerful and really spoke to, you know, it was a very tender and warm message, you know, about, you know, a healthy, caring relationship between people. And I don't, I, I don't want to say that a man could not have written the song, but I think that Carol King's writing brought a certain tenderness to that and emphasized the importance of platonic love and platonic care. And lastly, Barracuda, which um, again is by the band Heart. I'm sure you guys have heard it. It's got that really signature beefy guitar tone at the beginning, uh, really fun, you know, really great song to rock out on. It was actually written in retaliation, their record label um, that the band was signed to had put out this really slimy ad insinuating some awful things about the sisters who headed the band. And um, as a result, when they found out about this, they wrote the song Barracuda and the Barracuda, you know, it's a predatory fish. They were personifying their, you know, abusive, toxic, predatory record label as the Barracuda. They took their frustration and their anger and they channeled it into the song. And it was so unique and so cool because usually when you were hearing rock songs, you were hearing, you know, the Rolling Stones, you were hearing Pink Floyd, you were hearing Led Zeppelin. Even if the men were singing higher, it was male voices. So to have this piercing, powerful female vocal singing with from real experience and real emotion about the frustration and the betrayal that she felt, it was so unique and it wasn't an obvious message. It just was, you know, people were like, hey, cool guitar. <laughs> but beyond that, you know, it, the song had so much depth. And again, women dealing with this predatory figure and calling them out, retaliating. I thought that that was so interesting because I didn't know about that, the specific meaning of the song until I did some more research and realized, wow, you know, this is about a predator. This isn't just about, you know, some you know, fancy metaphor. This is a real life experience that many people have and have to deal with. And the song just gave this empowerment and retaliation against it in a really unique way. So um, again, all four songs, very different stylistically, thematically, vocally. And, um, but it really allowed me to touch on, again, a lot a very diverse, you know, a lot of diverse perspectives from different women who came from different backgrounds I, I wanted to kind of take an intersectional approach to it because again, you know, there's just, there's no one singular way to define American music. There's, there are so many incredible aspects to, you know, the music that, you know, women have written, especially, you know, 
and I, I do want to touch on real quick, a lot of the music that we listen to today goes back to women even before the four that I featured, women like Sister Rosetta Tharp and Big Mama Thornton, without whom we wouldn't have rock and roll, and therefore we wouldn't have all of these, we wouldn't have R&B, we wouldn't have hip hop, you know, so we owe so much to the women, women of color, et cetera, who came before us, which is why, again, we have, you know, songs, I think Cardi B's on top of the charts right now, for example, she's a woman of color, like it or don't like it, you know, her music specifically, you know, there's definitely a lot of powerful, excellent, and Taylor Swift, again, reclaiming her songs, topping the charts. There's a lot of incredible female songwriting and, you know, opinions being expressed going on today that without these women that came in the 1960s, 1960s and 70s and even before, you know, who knows where we would be, who knows how much project, progress that we actually would have made. What a great project. Thank you. What a great project. Uh, I want to shift over to our second speaker now, and then uh, after her presentation, we'll open the floor for any number of questions that, that may come in. So uh, thank you, Miranda. That was great. How am I going to compete with that? <laughs> <laughs> love Miranda's project. I love it. Um, sorry. So, yeah. So I'm going to introduce you. Uh, our, our second speaker is Hanan Bayen. Uh, she is a religious studies and global studies major, minoring in honors, who plans to graduate this very semester. Her thesis title is Never Again, Analysis of the Rohingya Crisis and the Role of Religion in Conflict. And her thesis director is Dr. Rebecca King, professor, um, Associate Professor of Religious Studies. After graduation, Hanan plans to go to graduate school abroad to study peace studies with a focus on religious conflict. And she's gonna do wonderful things in this world, I can tell you. Uh, one interesting fact about her, this will be, this will not be new to her. She has already studied abroad twice in Japan. So um, I hand it over to Hanan. Hello. Okay, sorry, something popped up. Um, hi. So my thesis focused, as the title says, the role of religion in conflict, but specifically the relationship between religion and violence. Um, kind of starting at the process, I started in June drafting up and working on my um, proposal um, since I was abroad last spring. So I didn't know exactly what I wanted to talk about, but I knew I wanted to talk about religion and I wanted to talk about, I wanted to combine my two majors. So I was trying to find something in which I could clearly kind of have my own input as a student, finally um, being the researcher and the writer. Um, kind of having that agency and, and saying my part about um, what I've learned and what I've been seeing. And so I picked the Rohingya as my case study. And if you don't know, the Rohingya is a Muslim minority in Myanmar, who, which is a country in Southeast Asia. And I had heard about them in the news and I actually learned about them in one of my religious studies classes. And it kind of boggled my mind because I was like wait hold on this is like a full genocide that's going on and like I feel like no one's talking about it it's like how are we gonna just like speed past that like that's not happening and then once I got into kind of looking into the news a bit more I was realizing that that wasn't the only instance of religious minorities being persecuted in countries as you see in China and in India and so it kind of set a fire in me of like well why is no one talking about this I want to I want to get to why is this happening three times around three in separate like countries in the world this is happening and why is that and so that kind of was the first push towards talking about religion and conflict and I chose the Rohingya as my case study because it was a more timely the genocide started in 2017 whereas the other two cases were a little bit more recent so I felt that it, I kind of had a lot more to work with um I spent a lot of time in the beginning trying to find out my thesis because I started, it's a lot that I was wanting to cover. And the more specific I made it, the more, um, a stronger my analysis could be and how my thesis will be better. And so I wanted to look at through a lot of sources that I had, a lot of theoretical research. Mine was not creative, <laughs> mine was peer writing, um, but that's what I love to do. So it wasn't too hard. Um, 
And as a little bit of wisdom, the writing process is kind of all over the place when you do writing. Cause I think my thesis paper is like almost 40 pages. And you start at like the brainstorming, drafting, revising back to brainstorming and drafting back to brainstorming and then you're polishing. So don't expect it to be perfect the first time you type up everything. Um, and so I kind of approached my topic in a way of just not trying to solve it. I was like, I'm not trying to do a master plan. I can't achieve world peace as nice as that would be, but I would like to understand the relationship between religion and conflict, why they keep being together, why they always seem so intertwined so easily. And so I sought to answer, like try to find that answer in the Rohingya crisis. And so I approached it by looking at the historical background. I felt that the history of the conflict was the most important thing to establish because a lot of times in conflicts like that, history is very iffy. People have different accounts of what happened and narratives, especially in a country like Myanmar, that um, doesn't have a clear understanding of what's you know true and what's not um and it was hard during the process because i kept struggling with trying to understand where power lied in this political situ situation because it was really hard to like define it um for a little bit more context the main conflict in myanmar is that there are national there's a really big nationalist movement of buddhists who are um, oppressing the Rohingya, who's a Muslim minority that's been there for dec like centuries. Um, and so I was first of all confused of why Buddhists were trying to, were being violent. They had mobs, they were killing the Rohingya. And so that threw me off because from my Western perspective, I was like, wait, Buddhists are supposed to be like peacemakers. Like, why is it that they're the ones killing these people? And so that was something that I had to confront with my own biases and own preconceived notions that a lot were combated during this research process. Um, and realizing that religion and politics often, you know, are together, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's true of what the religion is. And so I had to kind of look at the government and the Buddhist majority um, nationalist and looking at the Rohingya and try to figure out where the power lied and then literally in the middle of my drafting process, a coup happened in the country in Myanmar that I was studying. And it flipped my entire thesis project on its head because I was like, oh, so wait, I just got my answer. So now what? Like I found out like where the power lies. So then how am I going to come up with like, what is my conclusion then? And so I had to backtrack and I met with my thesis director literally every week. I was like, do you understand what's going on? Like, I don't know what's going on. And it was very um, overwhelming, but weird to say exciting because I was in the middle of researching this stuff and having to, very similar to Miranda, so much reading, so much, um, JSTOR was my best friend, um, I had to do so much um, highlighting and underlining and, and bibliography stuff. So it was a lot of information that I already had. And so with the knowledge that I had, it made it really easy to shift my perspective and what I wanted to argue at the end. And so I look at the history, I talk about the um, genocide itself, the recent events that happened, and I, towards the end, aim to try to offer not necessarily a solution, but ways in which we can utilize existing systems that push, push for human rights, that push for, um, you know, equality and justice globally, and how we can push for a better world. And that's kind of why it says never again, because I just felt like with all these genocides, we keep saying never again, and yet they're still happening. And so I try my best to offer solutions of how that will never happen again. Um, so that was a lot. But yeah, I don't know what else I could say. Um, in terms of words of wisdom, please time manage. I know everyone tells you that, but you have to you know, your thesis director can help you as much as they want, but at the end of the day, you are the one that needs to type up, you know, what you got to do and making sure that you're on track and making sure that your schedule that you make when your proposal's ready is good to go. And you got to stick to that. That's my biggest advice because that was really difficult for me to do with all like my drafting and writing because it was a lot of my own, you know, work, obviously. So, yeah. <laughs> but other than that, I don't know if I have much else to say. I'm going to say something y'all want me to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for that overview and, and for those words of wisdom. Uh, now we're going to open this up to the to the whole class. And I, I would invite 
anyone with a question to ask it. Um, 